John, I don't want you to play computer games while we're gone, okay? John, did you hear me? I don't want you to play computer games while we're gone, okay? John, did you hear me? Okay, mom, I said, while my mind was swirling with all the different games I was going to play while my mom and dad were gone. My brother and I had done this countless times already. My parents would leave for Wednesday night service at about 7.30 p.m., and they'd be home around 10.15. And so as long as we turned off the computer, turned off the lights, and crawled into bed by 10.10, we were perfectly fine. She would tell us the same thing week after week to make sure to do our homework, to not play computer games. I would tell her, okay, mom, I promise, and proceed to play video games until she came back. But tonight was different. I mean, everything was going according to plan. We played our games until 10.10 and rolled into bed, pretending to snore by the time our parents snuck their heads into our rooms. But this time, she actually came into the room, which was unusual. Then she came right next to the computer that was in the room, and she put her hand against the back of the computer. She immediately felt the scorching heat against the back of that computer, and this was the one sure sign that the computer had been turned off very recently. She, th she then spoke these two words that pierced through this dark room that night. She goes, get up. That day was the day she realized we hadn't been listening to her. That was the day she realized that all the time she told us not to play computer games. We were hearing what she had to say, but we weren't doing what she had asked us to do. We were listening, but we weren't doing. We all know of these examples in our lives where we listen to someone or something, but we don't actually do it. Maybe it was a coworker asking you to reply back to an email, and you said, sure, but you never get around to it. Or someone in your house asking you to thaw something out of the freezer for dinner, and we say sure, and completely forget about it until five minutes before they walk through the door. Most of us have heard from scientists for years and years that our bodies require around eight hours of sleep a night. But some of us might find ourselves watching a random, unnecessary YouTube video about whether or not double stuffed Oreos are actually double the stuffing of original Oreos at one in the morning when we need to get up by 6.30 for school. We all know that listening, reading, or hearing someone's words is not the same thing as doing what someone says. So why is it that so many of us in the church think that coming to church to hear the Word of God is the same thing as doing the Word of God? Why have we confused listening to the Word of God with doing the Word of God? Because just like it is in the world, hearing and doing are two fundamentally different things according to our passage today. We are currently in the middle of our Deep and Wise Summer Series, and we've been exploring and searching for wisdom for our lives through the book of James. So today's passage gives us wisdom on how we should live. And it tells us why we shouldn't just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. But before we open up to James chapter 1, verses 22 through 27, we're going to see in this passage that there is a risk to not doing the word of God. We know this for some of us who are more prone to just let things go in through one year and right through the other. The risk, uh, that there is a risk associated with that. And the risk of listening to my mom but not doing what my mom said was that yes, that homework that had to get done didn't get completed. And my grades and education stumbled a bit from it. And the risk of not replying to that work email might be a delayed project. Or the risk of not thawing out that meat might mean a ruined dinner. And the risk of not getting eight hours of sleep is waking up groggy. So we drink coffee to make up for the lack of sleep. And then we get anxious from the caffeine and the coffee. And then it prevents us from getting things we need to get done. And we get into this vicious cycle. Am I right, coffee drinkers? And in our passage today, James says there is one risk that we run by only hearing and not doing the word of God. So let's see what that is in our passage today in James chapter 1, verses 20 through to 27. It says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So the risk of listening to the word and not doing the word is deception. 
I love the way James writes because he gets really straight to the point. He doesn't mince his feelings or his words. And he describes these people who listen to God's word, who consider themselves religious people, yet don't live out the heart of God, as those who are being deceived. Verse 22 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Well, what does James mean by that? What are these people being deceived by? Well, the word deception here is used to describe someone blinded to the reality of one's true religious state. Isn't that a really sobering thought? That these people who were spending all this time hearing the word of God were being blinded by the reality of their own true religious state because they weren't actually living it out. And these people that James were writing to were definitely hearing the word of God because during this time, we were still far removed from the printing press. So the way people knew and learned about the word of God was literally through hearing other people recite the word of God. And so hearing is important. It doesn't say do not listen to the word of God, but it says do not merely listen to the word of God. Do not only exclusively just listen to the word of God, do what it says. But to a certain capacity, I think a lot of people judge each other's religious states by how many sermons, Bible studies, or Christian books you've consumed. Uh, during the height of the pandemic, when all of us were home on Sundays, some of my pastor friends would humbly brag about how many church services they watched that day. Yeah, I wake up early to catch my service, and then I watch a service in the central time zone, then I catch a service in California, and then before I go to bed, I watch a service uh, in Korea. How many services have you watched today, John? I'm like, well, I, I one in every time zone, I don't know. <laughs> but, and, you know, not that hearing the word is bad, but we often use that as a barometer of maturity or depth of spirituality. And so we lift certain people up and oftentimes pastors on a pedestal. Oh, that person reads so many Christian books, never misses a service and takes a spirituality course on the side. And again, that's not bad at all. But the reason James says that these people are being blinded to the reality of their religious state wasn't due to a lack of hearing of the word of God. There was an abundance of that. It was because they were merely only exclusively listening to the word of God and not doing what it says. Specifically in the book of James, he's writing to people who are listening to the word, yet they were still doing these three things. Some were, um, some with wealth and power, they were oppressing the poor. Some were denying the command of Jesus to love our neighbors. And others were showing favoritism towards the wealthy. Does this sound familiar to us at all? Are there people in the church who hear the word of God in abundance, yet not do it? I know I'm one of them. Uh, I was actually trying to calculate this. I've probably listened throughout my life a minimum of 6,000 sermons. I've preached over 600 times. I've heard and listened to an abundance of God's word. But many times I find myself merely listening to God's word and not caring for my neighbors, merely listening to God's word and not caring more for, uh, and caring more for my wealth and not for the wealth of others. I listen and then quickly forget. How many more sermons do we need to be reminded that Jesus actually cared for the most marginalized groups in society, that he radically loved in ways that made the religious types uncomfortable, that he actually spent his short time on earth with lepers, beggars, children, and tax collectors? James likens it to someone who looks at their face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forget what he looks like. It says this, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forget what he looks like. Uh, it's kind of like this. When, when I used to be a children's pastor, I used to play basketball with kids all the time. And as a pastor, I was taught you should let kids beat you in things. You don't want to lower their self-esteem. So when I played with them, I would intentionally let them win and I had done this for years. Then one Sunday afternoon, uh, we're playing basketball and this kid in second grade goes, John, you're so bad. I bet I can beat you one-on-one. -on -one. And it kind of got irrationally angry because he thought he was better than me. So did I lose to him or did I try to destroy him? I destroyed him. Why? Because in my mind, I was like, he's been deceived. He needs to know the truth that I can beat him whenever I want. So I thought I taught him this valuable lesson in humility as I was gloating about beating a second grader. But the next week he comes back to church and we go out to play basketball and he goes, John, you're so bad. I bet you I can beat you. And I was like, wait a second. 
did you just forget I beat you last week? And I was like, you only beat me because you got lucky that time. And this was the kind of phenomenon that James was describing about his readers. He was saying that they were being deceived because they kept on hearing the word, but then they forgot that they weren't supposed to be oppressing the poor. And so they would come back, look at the mirror and be like, oh yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. And then immediately leave and forget how they were supposed to live. But there's also this second group of people who run the risk of deceiving themselves, according to James. The first group of people are people who listen and don't do. But this group of people are people who consider themselves religious, yet don't have control over their speech. Verse 27 says, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. I think what James might be getting at here Sometimes religious people are more concerned with being right than they are with being loved. They want people to hear what they have to say about whatever opinion that they have, that they believe to be absolute truth. But James is saying that being right is not important if you're not being loved. I think it's fair to say that Christians are one of the many vocal voices about what they believe is truly right and what is truly wrong. When Roe, v. Wade, when Roe v. Wade was overturned, the pro-life advocates, many of them Christians, were extremely vocal in their celebration, but also extremely vocal in their harsh disagreement with pro-choice advocates. But I found myself this week having a conversation with an organization called Fostering Hope, which is an organization that Grace Chapel has worked with that empowers churches to care for children and families impacted by foster care. And in my conversation with one of the founders, he told me that the reality of this decision is that in the near future, they anticipate many more children in the foster care system, which currently is already pretty strained. There is no shortage of pro-life Christians making their voices heard. But there is currently a shortage of people actually creating and opening up loving homes to foster these very children. James is telling us to talk less and to love more. He's telling us that the pursuit of what we believe to be right is not important if we are not being loved. And and that sounds harsh, but actually what James says in this passage is even harsher. He says that kind of religion is worthless, meaningless. And this is why I think the younger generation have been so skeptical and critical of the faith that they've been passed down. Because sometimes we've been more enamored with talking about what we think is right without actually living in love. So why should we actually do what the Word of God says instead of just listen to it? Well, James says, is because that there is a reward in doing it. And that reward is love. In verse 27, James compares the kind of religion we just just talked about, a religion that talks too much with a kind of religion that God actually desires. It says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. The reason James says to look after widows and orphans is because women and orphans in this society were unfairly helpless to provide for themselves. So the kind of religion that God accepts, James is describing, is one that cares for and loves those unable to provide for themselves. But I wanna make sure that we understand that this isn't about men having to save women and children and provide them shelter and food, no, 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 no. Loving those unable to provide for themselves is also fighting to topple systems that have allowed for inequalities like this to exist. When we do the word of God, we get the reward of being able to love and advocate for others. I also want you to notice what I didn't say the reward is. The reward isn't heaven, salvation. We don't pursue living out the way of Jesus because of the reward of going to heaven. The name of this church is Grace Chapel because we live by grace. What we do or don't do is in a matter of salvation. Jesus has already taken care of that on the cross. But the reason we love is because that is the way in which we see Jesus caring for those unable to help themselves over and over again in Scripture. And not only do we have opportunities to love and bless others doing the Word of God, it also blesses our lives as well. Verse 25 says, 
But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. As the one who made us informs us, God knows what is best for our lives. There's this book out there called The Year of Living Biblically, which was actually a very impressive journey of an agnostic journalist following every single law in the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He didn't cut his hair. He didn't wear cloths of two different, he didn't wear clothes of two different types of fabrics. And at one point, uh, he said he had to throw tiny pebbles at an adulterer because there was a law about stoning adulterers. It was a tongue in cheek experiment for a book he was writing. But his reflection from the process of doing this activity of literally living biblically was he found out that your behavior really affects your thoughts. He said one of the laws he followed was not gossiping about other people. And as he forced himself to not gossip, he stopped having negative thoughts about his friends, coworkers, and family members, and it improved his life so much. And he said as he gave thanks every day, he realized he became a much more grateful person. He stumbled into something that often takes a lifetime to learn. As one author puts it, it is easier to act your way to a new way of thinking than to think your way to a new way of acting. And I know that can sound a little counterintuitive, counterintuitive for us in the church, but this is exactly why we have spiritual practices. Because when we live in the beautiful way of Jesus, it transforms us. And the way of Jesus is loving our neighbors as ourselves our lives will be transformed by the doing of the Word of God. So the question I have for us is, uh, for today is this. How is being right keeping you from being loved? In what ways has our pursuit of being right deceived us from being loved? This isn't to condemn anyone or to guilt anyone to their lack of doing. No, that's not it at all. Again, we live in grace but it is to convince us of the reward of loving and caring for others and the blessing that it is and the way it ends up transforming our lives. And the second question I have for us is this. In what ways can you today love someone unable to help themselves? Think about that. I want to give us just one example of how some of us have done that recently and the impact that this kind of love can make. As many of us know, on February 28th, Russia bombed Ukraine. And within days, we began to hear of thousands of Ukrainians fleeing for their lives, seeking refuge from war. And so we invited Grace Chapel to come alongside Ukrainian refugees. And you all responded with an amazingly generous special offering. And in just over a month, you guys gave over $170,000. Thank you so much for your extraordinary generosity. And thank you so much for loving our neighbors and doing and not just hearing. And so our funds went to three long-term partners, uh, World Relief and two Moldovan partners, Jesus Savior Church and Invest Credit. All three ministries have been sharing the love of Christ with the Ukrainian people. So a month ago, Pastor Jeanette, along with a Grace Chapel videographer, Jin, had the privilege of visiting our Moldovan partners. And they saw the gift of Christian love being extended day in and day out. So let's see what it looks like to be people who do instead of just listen. Jin and I are here at the border between Moldova and Ukraine in a city called Palanka, which has processed many Ukrainians who've been fleeing the conflict. Our partners, Jesus Savior Church, has been a constant presence here since the beginning of the wartime in early March. Been through the winter season and now into almost the summer season, welcoming people, helping people get adjusted, and finding their ways into other parts of the, the European Union and around the globe. My name is Vitali Fedula. I am the pastor of Jesus Savior Church. And now by God's grace and, and, and provision, we are now in Palanka. And this is the gate, if I can say, where so many refugees came from Ukraine, came to, to Moldova. And the line of the people that were waiting to come to the border was 12 kilometers. Many of them were, were telling me in tears, Pastor Vitali, we had just 15 minutes only to put something in what we 
you know, got in one life, put in one bag and just step in a bus and, 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 and escape. So when I asked them why you came, they said we made this sacrifice, I mean being separated by the family because of the future, for the future of our kids. Uh, at least I know where I'm going, I have a friend, and some people have families, but a lot of them have no idea where they're going. And it's scary because you don't know what's, what's there for them and where they're going to end up. And even though there's a lot of amazing people that help and, you know, we really appreciate the whole nation, we really appreciate what people are doing for us, but it's still, uh, it's still scary because, yeah, you don't know where you're going, you don't know when, when you're going to come back, and you don't know if there will be a place to come, come back to. At least I know that my, my house is still there and my family is alive, but for a lot of people, they can say the same. In March, Jesus Savior Church became a Ukrainian refugee center in a few days' time. Children's ministry has temporarily stopped. Sunday school rooms and even the sanctuary has been transformed into makeshift dormitories. The guests are primarily women and children. Some stay only short term for a day or two. Others have stayed for months. Since the crisis began, Jesus Savior Church has been working hard to complete the first two floors of their seven-story educational building to better provide housing and meals for the refugees. Many have requested to stay longer, waiting for the day they can return safely to their homes in Ukraine. Another ministry partner serving refugees is Invest Credit, led by Gena Rusu. Ordinarily, Invest Credit provides loans for entrepreneurs and small businesses, but in wartime, they are also partnering with a business led by an American missionary, Stephen. Tessa is a cleaning business offering their services to launder the bedding and linens used by refugee centers. I'm Gianna Russo. I have the privilege to lead Invest Credit. Invest Credit is a Christian based micro-enterprise development organization. Our goal is to help people to start and develop their businesses. Entrepreneurs are really special people. It's, it's almost like a special breed of people. They have the strength and the resilience and the creativity and that spirit that everything is possible. And I really like, I love and enjoy working around people like that. I think it's a, the most beautiful calling uh, that you can receive from God to work around people who want to change the world and make it for better. Hello, my name is Stephen Yates. Uh, I am an American expat living in Eastern Europe. So we moved to Moldova in 2005. For the last uh, five years, I've been working at uh, building a, a cleaning business called Tessa. And we, we specialize in carpet cleaning, furniture and upholstery. We will soon begin uh, a laundry service and a lot of that currently um, helping uh, those who are, who are serving uh, refugees with, with uh, some equipment that we've been, helped, uh, we've been helped to purchase. Stephen is working to convert his rug cleaning facility into a central laundry to clean the bedding and linens of refugee centers. With help from Grace Chapel, Stephen is able to purchase industrial size washer and dryers. How remarkable that a small country like Moldova continues to offer relief to Ukrainian refugees. Moldova is one of Europe's most materially poor nations, and yet it has the highest per capita refugee population in the entire region. Moldovans are all too aware that they may be the next nation Russia would like to overtake. They speculate that it would take only two hours for Russia to gain control of the entire country. You know, it wasn't about like, hey, when they get here, what colors are we going to, you know, paint the walls so that we can receive children? It was like, like, do you have a room? And like, how many people could you lay there <laughs> kind of thing, you know, like, and everybody's church got turned into a a little center, uh, including our church and Jesus Salvatore and Svinta Traimia and almost every church that I know. I think the Christian, the evangelical Christian church here in Moldova is, it's going to be changed for at least a generation. Mm. Like this generation will not be the same. Mm. And there's, there's just something that happens when you work closely to people and you sacrifice alongside other people, like relationships are built that are, they're different. 
We're grateful for the efforts of our long-term ministry partners in Moldova who, as the war began, made strategic, critical ministry pivots to meet the needs of their Ukrainian neighbors. They are doing the hard work each day, choosing to sacrifice and offer acts of love, kindness, and service. Altogether, these small acts of love and service offered in Jesus' name help someone take another step on their journey. Small steps, perhaps, but with God's help, hopeful steps towards rebuilding their lives to dare to hope and dream again for themselves and their children. Jesus invites us to love and care for our neighbors near and far. So let's continue to pray for the peace of Ukraine. May these partners and others who are serving their Ukrainian refugee neighbors not weary in the good they are doing. May they and we experience the love of God and His presence as we love and serve our hurting world. This video that shows the work of the Moldovans for Ukrainian refugees particularly moved me because during the very beginning of the war, uh, I remember watching a video of a dad having to say goodbye to his daughter during the Ukraine war. And he was staying behind ooh, boy, uh, to fight in the war while his child was going onto a bus about to be a refugee. And he saw this video literally as I was holding my newborn son a few months ago weeping. And I'd always wondered, I wonder how that little girl is doing. I wonder if she's being cared for somewhere. It has food and clothes and shelter. So as I was watching this video with the people in Moldova, my heart was so moved because I was able to see people doing and living out the heart of Jesus to care for orphans and widows and caring for those and loving those who were unable to care for themselves in that moment. And as I was watching this video, I could see Jesus saying, yes, 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 this is what I'm talking about. Not just gathering to hear and to listen to the words again and again, but caring after those unable to help themselves. In fact, uh, Pastor Jeanette talks about how Jesus Savior Church had turned their sanctuary into a sleeping area for more refugees. And to many Moldovans, the sanctuary is a very sacred place, a sacred place where the word of God is preached. But in the midst of this great need to care for refugees, they were more concerned about being loved than they were concerned about being right. And they said, your problem is our problem. And so they opened up their sanctuary so that people would be able to sleep and rest there. This kind of love is true religion. May we be not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word. God, thank you so much for the way in, in which you're so gracious to us, even when we aren't the best people in living out the way of Jesus. But I ask that you would help us, God, to become better stewards of the words that you have given to us, to care for our neighbors and to love our neighbors. I ask, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would move our hearts, would compel us to love our neighbors better and to care for those unable to care for themselves. We thank you that you have uh, embodied that and modeled that through Jesus. And that we have an example to look to in the ways that Jesus so sacrificially loved and cared for others. May we take that on in the way that we live. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.